Hello everyone, this is Ryan Wagner with HIST 820. Uh, week 5, discussing our online history lecture. So, in choosing a topic, uh, it sounded like we could do a topic of our choosing, but I wanted to focus on um, a topic that was uh, in line with the course that I'm uh, developing for our, our course. and um, But also find a topic within that that was uh, would be considered controversial. So um, the course that I'm working on is called the United States Indochina and its Legacy, um, and so a controversial topic, but something that would meet one of my course learning objectives. Uh, so um, one of those was to synthesize uh, the Vietnam War uh, and exposing how um, the anti-war, uh, anti-Vietnam War, the student uh, movement. Uh, activists shaped uh, the struggles of social, racial, or and or economic uh, equality. Um, so I, I chose that here. Uh, and then my attendant audience, of course, uh, the course has been developed for an undergraduate course, uh, likely at the 300 level. Um, so I've just uh, assigned it HIS 301. Uh, and with that, I'll get started with the lecture. Hello course, uh, this is Ryan Wagner, um, your instructor for the course. Uh, this week my lecture is on the anti-war movement uh, during the Vietnam War uh, and uh, we'll be discussing a wide range of topics uh, in a very short uh, time, but I want you to think about um, if you were a student during the Vietnam War uh, and you were to see some of these things that were occurring overseas in Southeast Asia, or even if you could reflect on um, times in your life, uh, whether it's maybe the post 9-11 era, and that you could um, tie the two together or see some correlations with that uh, and help relate the course material uh, with some of your own personal experiences. So first an overview of what I'll be discussing. Um, so anti-colonialism in Southeast Asia uh, and their um, the Vietnamese people and how they looked at uh, colonialism, uh, the student movement here in the United States, uh, and then how that developed in the anti-war movement, uh, some brief uh, pieces of the media involvement, and then maybe some lasting impacts that we can talk about. So first, uh, looking at the anti-colonialism uh, movement in Southeast Asia. So uh, during the 20th century, there was um, several significant power shifts uh, that were found, uh, seen in the area. Um, specifically during World War II, uh, Vietnam was in constant flux. Uh, um, it was, it's always been viewed as a, uh, a location of strategic importance. Um, so, um, you know, the United States didn't want to see communism continue to spread. Uh, and those in Asia, whether it's China, Japan, Russia, um, felt that um, that area, due to access to um, the Pacific and some of the uh, trade routes uh, and strategic location uh, for their military presence, uh, Vietnam was important. So um, during the Cold War, um, Vietnam was continued to be seen as that. Uh, and then it, from 1946 to 1954, um, Vietnam finally, uh, during after the first Indochina War, uh, it was separated. So uh, Cambodia and Laos uh, w did gain their own independence. Uh, how Vietnam was separated was a little bit more uh, challenging. So the North or North Vietnam was um, created into a, uh, a communist nation, and the South uh, was is an anti-communist uh, nation. Um, so all these periods, uh, the Vietnamese people struggled with um, external influence, and the movement within the nation uh, was fairly strong as far as anti-colonialism goes. Um, they had constant external influence uh, in the nation, and they felt that the uh, those actors were not act they were not acting in um, the Vietnamese people's best interest. So uh, in the United States, uh, during uh, this period, a, the student movement uh, was picking up steam. And a lot of this was uh, students were being mobilized over free speech. Um, 
there there was an impact on the Vietnamese War and uh, America's um, expansion in the area uh, in Southeast Asia, and the student movement was not particularly um, supportive of that. And then there was a pretty significant distrust for the Johnson and Nixon administrations um, from uh, students and uh, campus campus centers. So. In 1964, at the University of California at Berkeley, um, some students were beginning to mobilize over free speech. Uh, the university was restricting uh, political organizations on campus um, over the concern that the university uh, may, um, may be seen as either supporting a, a specific political affiliation um, or they just wanted to try to uh, maintain a reputation that they uh, they 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 didn't take a position, um, but uh, the students continued to gather, and that movement spread very quickly um, throughout the United States to other campus locations. So, uh, with that spread uh, at the University of Michigan, um, there was some students uh, that uh, began to. Uh, worked together and created a group called the Students for Democratic Society, or SDS. Uh, and they, much like the folks at uh, Berkeley, um, opposed uh, uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, and, of course, they encouraged free speech. They, they wanted to politically organize on college campus centers. Um, and this, this group, the SDS, uh, issued uh, what they refer to as the Port Huron Statement, and um, this official statement from the group criticized uh, U.S. foreign policy and uh, U.S. military involvement in uh, Southeast Asia and claimed that there was uh, Cold War motivations. Uh, we wanted to ensure we were there to combat the spread of communism and we weren't really there for the, um, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese people or we were there for our own interests. Additionally, um, the student movement, or the SDS, uh, created a new uh, political party or a, a p political affiliation called the New Left, and um, they opposed uh, authority, um, encouraged sexual liberation, and additionally encouraged uh, drug use, uh, and uh, were a proponent of um, uh, no federal regulation uh, on that on those uh, using uh, drugs. So, um, you know, looking at the anti-war movement, uh, students were effectively organized. Uh, but what are what about the rest of America? You know, um, in studying the, this area, a lot of uh, times we focus so much on students, but um, that was not the only group that opposed uh, the war. Um, the draft, it continued to impact everyone across the board. Of course, college students were in a prime age to be impacted by that, but um, much of the United States, regardless of age, did not support the draft. Um, spending, uh, so what we were spending in Southeast Asia continued to skyrocket. It was, it was climbing, uh, and really the economic uh, well-being of the United States was beginning to be impacted. Um, it was we were struggling at home, uh, and uh, with overseas spending and uh, foreign policy um, taking U.S. troops and more U.S. taxpayer money overseas, uh, it became increasingly um, uh, not popular. Um, so. Many began to lose trust in the administration or the involvement in the war effort. And uh, beyond the student uh, movement, uh, there, were, there were other organizations that began to speak um, in opposition to the war. So some civil war or uh, civil rights organizations, uh, so even some religious groups uh, opposed the war and were willing to issue official statements. And eventually, even there were a large pool of Vietnam veterans that began to speak against the war uh, and U.S. involvement in the war, uh, which certainly did not help um, the administration. So then media. Um, you know, media was something that continued to grow uh, in importance uh, throughout the 20th century. So in 1968, um, uh, President Nixon wins the election. 
and uh, he he really capitalized on the anti-war sentiment, um, and he targeted the previous administration based upon that. So the media, who now, uh, and I know it's cosmic to think that at one point we didn't have uh, televised media, but um, they were really uh, beginning to televise. Um, uh, they had a news cycle, uh, and the, of course, print was still viable. The internet didn't exist, but um, televised and print uh, really pushed uh, and had a major impact on both the presidential election and the anti-war movement. Um, so it maintained the momentum uh, and continued to push an anti-war narrative. So um, additionally, uh, the press was much more active in Vietnam. They were bringing uh, pictures, uh, video coverage, in some cases very gruesome footage uh, back to the United States, and they were airing it in real time. Uh, and that had a major impact on uh, the opinion of across America on the war. And then, of course, in 1971, uh, something that we've probably, most of us have heard of, uh, Watergate, uh, the New York Times exposed the Nixon's uh, authorization for wiretapping uh, on his political opponents, uh, and it had a major shift uh, or had a major impact on uh, political opinion. So then let's uh, briefly think about some lasting impacts, and the, this is really more for you to sort of consider uh, in... Um, you know, as, as the lecture finishes. So, you know, what kinds of lasting impacts do you think the Vietnam War had on social, cultural, and political parts of the American society? So, um, again, think about maybe today, uh, and uh, do you still see some impacts from the Vietnam War, or can you associate uh, the war movement with something else that's occurred in the last 20 years? Um, can you, re can you re relate the anti-war movement even the student movement, maybe on your own campus uh, or at home or, or something else that you've seen, um, or even the media involvement um, that you've seen in your adult life. And then has student involvement changed? So let's think about social media. Um, now, social media wasn't a thing during the Vietnam War, but have you seen that change or has the media become uh, less or more involved in uh, American opinion? Um, so that's all I have for the lecture today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned a few things. Um, please reach out to me uh, through email, phone, uh, or text. Uh, I'd be happy to continue the conversation uh, over today's lecture. Take care.